Okay, good morning. Good morning. It's great to be good with morning. you. We just got back from a trip to Europe to visit two grandsons, the parents of one of the grandsons we also do, <laughs> a six-month-old baby. Uh, so if I sound a little confused, we've been dealing with six time zones and we got back Friday afternoon, so bear with me. Uh, it's good to have you here and welcome to those online. Um, I, I believe I volunteered for this class because it's one of my loves in scripture. Proverbs and James are my two favorite books. Probably reflecting something of my own history growing up uh, economically in a lower middle class family. Um, and the Christian faith as I experienced it was very down to earth here and now, make a difference today. So. Uh, I'm signaling what I think Proverbs is about, um, and I will acknowledge my passion for this book, and there's probably more here that we can deal with. That's okay. Uh, you've got it in print. And there was an extra handout that I'm not really going to deal with, but um, a quote from um, N.T. Wright's book, Surprised by Hope. If I have time, I'll make a few comments about it and why I think there's a link uh, to Proverbs. Um, so uh, I've asked, uh, come on in, welcome. Um, Rob, would you open us with prayer? I certainly will. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here this morning and look at the book of Proverbs. Certainly all of us need your wisdom, the world needs your wisdom and guidance, and we pray that you would bless this time, as we look at what these wise uh, persons of old had to write down and how it applies to us today. Amen. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm not going to read them or go over them, but I put a few quotes at the start that for me link to Proverbs, a more excellent way, um, the Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible uh, about the Word of God that has to do with teaching and um, meditating on God's Word. And then the Colossians quote, uh, teaching admonish one another in all wisdom. <laughs> I like that phrase, all. <laughs> I don't claim to have all wisdom, but maybe corporately we do. And I like this quote from um, one of the commentaries I used by David Hubbard, Proverbs becomes not a stepping stone to legalism, but a signpost to grace. Because one of the, I think one of the potential risks of something like using Proverbs is this is it. You must do this, uh, and you could flip over into legalism. I like this imagery of a signpost, of thinking of them as pointing us in a direction. And having just been in one, two, what, five different airports, and <laughs> sometimes the signage was helpful, sometimes it wasn't yeah. have a particular excitement about effective time post that you know where. Is there a proverb about that? <laughs> <laughs> Probably is. <laughs> I, I like that image of uh, the sign post to grace not legalism. Uh, I, I, I like that. All right. Um, first of all, how would you define a proverb? We're not talking about necessarily a biblical. What, what is a proverb? What kind of communication is a proverb? Well, first, it, it's a succinct statement. A succinct, okay. That would be one. And it tries to address the wisdom, I guess. I can't think of the words to use to say it. It's a succinct statement that tries to Present a moral truth. Would that okay. be what say? <laughs> Other a truth based on experience. Experience. Road testing. Yeah. You know, it grows out of experience yeah. on for practical. practical. It tends not to be philosophical or abstract, mm -hmm. but it tends to be practical. Mm -hmm. The stitch in nines, time saves nine, and right. Right. Benjamin yeah. Franklin stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Practical. Yeah, if you're looking for the Pauline complex theology, you won't find it. Proverbs. Other comments about a proverb? I would say tested by time. Okay. 
and couched in a way that was easy for people to remember. Right. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Right. People can see that. And what I'm not equipped to do is some of these proverbs are, in the Hebrew, there's a play on words or there's rhyming that we uh, miss. Robert, no, who was it? Maybe it was Hubbard who tried in his translation to bring that across, but you can't always do that. Uh, another way to remember something with rhyming. Okay. Um, what are some common non-biblical proverbial statements that are influential in your life? Since I asked the question, I'll answer first. Years ago, I was called to Bradenton to organize a new church and stay there by the grace of God almost 30 years when I retired. And early on, I didn't know what I was doing. I had never started the church. We had property, but no building, no history, no critical mass and fortunately it organized fairly quickly and I was trying to deal with all of the challenges and we technically didn't have a session but we had a session <laughs> until we were organized and there were some push and pull about how we would do things and I got a little worked up about a couple of things and one day this older elder came in and said Bill do you mind if I give you a piece of advice. I said, sure. He said, choose your enemies carefully, or soon you will become like them. Now, enemies is a strong, but people weren't enemies. But I it, I said, John, John, do you think I'm making too much of a couple things? He said, well, since you ask, <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're upset, Bill, because they're very demanding, and you're starting to sound demanding yourself. So choose your enemies carefully, or soon you will become like them. What are some proverbs that have been influential or that you remember? I got one. I don't know if it's in Proverbs or not. Well, I'm talking about non-biblical. Everything in its a place for everything and everything in its place. place. Yep. I don't know if that's in Proverbs, but it's I one I violate so. all the time. <laughs> and that's one your wife. <laughs> yeah. No, no pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. You don't know what you're talking about. Keep your mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Okay. Take your cotton out of your ear and put it in your mouth. Yeah. In the 12 step program, that's one of their best. By the way, if you don't know, Proverbs are very popular in the 12 step movement. Do the next right thing. Say what, you mean, mean what, say what you mean and mean what you say. One day at a time. Or don't say it meanly. Yeah. Say what you mean and don't say it meanly. Others. It that, takes a village and it you know. speaks to this church, this village. Yeah. yeah. God gave us two ears and one mouth. <laughs> we listen twice as much as we talk. That's why I did it well, the internet shall set you free. All right. Any others? And, and there are many. In, uh, in criminal investigation for 27 years, we had the guy we trusted was still a suspect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the third question in the spec we may have begun to deal with already. What is the value and effect of composing and using proverbs in our lives? Uh, one comment I would make, and it maybe it resonates or reflects what's already been said, it's a quick way of reminding me of what I already know. A quick story about that. When I was right out of seminary, I was in a special situation where I was serving a chapel in a low-income community and on the staff of a thousand member of a wealthy church three miles away. And so I thought it was a great idea I'd get to preach every Sunday in the chapel and then go assist worship. That sounded like a great idea until I got there and every Monday I had to start working on another one. And this farmer in the church who had only a sixth grade education and I became great buddies. And every Monday morning he'd come in knowing I love of coffee. We drink coffee and chat about things. And one Monday he came in and I must have looked lower than my legs, Mabel, and he said, What's wrong, Pastor? And I said, Well, I've been here about six weeks and 
you know, in seminary, I had a whole semester to prepare a sermon. I feel like I'm just not coming up with something new and different. And he said to me, preacher, I've been going to church all my life, and never once did I expect the preacher to tell me something I didn't already know. Instead, I want him or her to remind me of what I already know. <laughs> that was very, I said to him, you have no idea how that is helpful. <laughs> Don't have to be novel. So uh, that for me is, is one of the values. What, again, maybe we've already touched on this. What do Proverbs do for us? Biblical or not biblical? Makes us think before we act. Okay. Give us guidance on how to live. Okay. Again, they're road tested, they're time tested. Um, they and a whole other subject is um, the proverbs don't tell the whole truth. He who hesitates is lost. Look before you leap. Okay. <laughs> You, you have to, to balance them out. And one other thing that I, I I read a book once that advocated that there's more humor in the Bible than we realize. And what I'm about to quote may not be humorous to the women in here uh, because of the law. And, but one scholar pointed out women, in one sense, are the temptresses. And uh, chapter seven is all about this woman. It's like it's not the guy's fault. She allures him, but how does the book of Proverbs end? Right. There's a righteous woman who's very in, effective and very crafty and very resourceful. So it's, but in chapter 11, like a gold ring and a pink snout, is a beautiful woman without good sense. <laughs> At least to me, you could say, like a gold ring and a pig snout is a handsome man without good sense. <laughs> they just find that. Uh, um, talks about that. And, and yeah. given my age, one more, in chapter 16, gray hair is a crown of glory. It is in, in a righteous life. Now, the problem with that is you can look at me and say, Bill, there's not a lot of righteousness going on. <laughs> but you look at Sybil, then you say there's a tsunami of righteousness. <laughs> I have a twisted sense of humor. Uh, what about white hair? Yeah, well, white, gray, yes. A sign of righteousness. I like that. All right. And I know in here, this is true for all Bible studies. I'm not going to particularly dwell on thin, although we do need to understand what it meant. But it's what does what difference does it make today? How does this influence how we live today. And I know that I think the purpose of Proverbs is succinctly stated early on, and I've asked Sybil to read Proverbs 1, 2, through 6. And I know that the underlying, I think for obvious reasons, is something I have. For learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instruction and in wise healing, righteousness, justice, and equity. To teach shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and prudence to the young. Let the wise also hear and gain in learning, and the discerning acquire skill. To understand the proverb and the figure, the words of the wise and their ways. Thank you. Uh, I, I added for myself, I could have added verse 7, which many of us know. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise despise wisdom and instruction. That's a constant contrast throughout Proverbs. The wise do this, the foolish do that. Um, who is left out of that? What groups are addressed? What groups are identified? Wise. Yeah, yeah. Simple, the wise. The discerning. In other words, I think they signal that we're talking to everybody. Even if you've already got some wisdom, there's more to learn. At least that's how it strikes me. Uh, and it signals, thus my underlining, learning, understanding, instruction, 
teach, knowledge, gain in learning, understand. Tibble's father used to like to kid with me because I had a graduate school degree. Under there, he'd say, Bill, do you understand everything you know? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the right answer was no. <laughs> so, you, I'm sure you've heard that before. Knowledge is one thing, but there needs to be understanding uh, and wisdom. Something else I like about Proverbs, I think there's a, an attempt to balance life here. Um, and it pays attention to the wealthy and the poor. Now, given my rabbit trail mind, I did a search on the internet in the new revised standard version updated edition I note for you there. Will may be more versed in this brand new edition. My impression is it primarily pays attention to gender language and seeks to be sensitive to that. I haven't made an exhaustive study with this. It, it's, it's just come out recently. Um, in Proverbs, the word wisdom occurs 49 times, understanding 27, and knowledge 36. So those words re recur often. Now, often in Bible study, we deal with the author, the date, and I added style. And these are important, but I don't uh, tend to spend a lot of time on that, as I like to say, whoever wrote it, somebody wrote it. <laughs> and <laughs> if, if you haven't read those quotes, you, you, you can later. Basically, Proverbs by we could almost assume there was no one author. It begins by mentioning Solomon, but by the end of the book, it mentions others. And I've looked at about a dozen commentary, and there was general consensus, don't worry too much about who actually wrote it. Probably they were writing down what had been arrived at in, in the culture, right? I think that's part of the strength of Proverbs. It's not like one person has this insight and shares it, but it's, it's gained by um, living in community. Uh, and the date, therefore, is probably spans centuries. Um, I like this, these quotes about style. Uh, proverbs are artistic, the sages teach with vivid meta metaphors and similes, wordplay, rhythm, alliteration. Um, next paragraph, the search for knowledge is international and ecumenical in scope. I've already noted that there are more than one writers. At least some of them are foreign. Um, and Israel's teachers were persistently passionate in their concern to lead their students in the right path. Yes? I've uh, got a question. In, in my reading of Proverbs, I came across somebody who said that in the uh, Middle East there, they're the uh, scribes who could read and write, but most people couldn't. Uh, they formed like schools in the royal courts of the kings in that area. And so they referred to Egypt. There was a actual school of scribes that produced products. Mm -hmm. And the, the goal was that the king would rule in a good way. Right. That that was what they wanted to have happen. And so the, they're in the palace and they're reading, and they're writing, recording, uh, basically advice from the pharaoh or the king or whatever. And I wonder if you had come across that too, because uh, the, from what they say, this this point of view, we have somebody trying to encourage somebody like uh, King David or right. King Solomon to rule with justice, to, right. to be righteous, to not be tricked or fooled. And uh, to me, that that's an interesting putting uh, the Proverbs in the Old Testament next to what's happening in Egypt and Jordan and Assyria and all those countries well, around. Various of the commentaries make the case that originally this was a handbook for training young future leaders, yeah. male, male leaders. Well, yeah, we yeah. now think of it as universal, but there seem to be scholarly 
consensus that it was originally yeah. focused on. So you come across that as yeah, well yeah. That, yeah. that point of view. Yeah. Right. To me, yeah. that's helpful. This last paragraph here, Israel's teach, I liked it, were persistently passionate in their concern to lead their students in the right path. They argued, badgered, reasoned, illustrated, pleaded, warned, and commanded in mm -hmm. order to make their point. Uh, I will say something more about this a little later. I like that, that it's not always uh, pleasant. Uh, some of the language is we might hear today as being rather hard. I personally like that a honoring of a variety of tones and ways of dealing with people. And you don't have to be a parent to know that at times you argue with your kids, you badger them. <laughs> Why? Because you want them to be safe. You want them to become who they're capable of being. Now, that doesn't justify, you know, verbal abuse by any means, but this, this variety of ways of communicating. Now, not that I'm always comfortable with that, but to me, I put this quote in because it honors a variety of tones in, in communication. Something that isn't there in print that I came up with later, I, I like the use of body imagery in chapter six. Let me just read this to you. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that hurry to run to evil, a lying witness, and one who sows discord in a family. That imagery of what you can hear with, how you can speak, what you can do with your hands or your feet, that whole holistic uh, body imagery as a metaphor for symbolizing the ways we can either build community or destroy community. Now, I, I note that Proverbs 8, more than one scholar thought this was um, a helpful summary of Proverbs, you see the, the language full color, color portrait. Um, it describes it as the summit of Old Testament discipleship. And we're going to read one section at a time. Haynes is going to read the first verses, one through seven, uh, one through twenty-one. If you would, Haynes. Certainly. Does not wisdom call and understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all who live. Simple ones, hear prudence, learn prudence, excuse me, acquire intelligence. You who lack it, hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. For my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to one who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. I, wisdom, live with prudence and I attain knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hated Hatred of evil. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I have good advice and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me rulers rule and nobles all who govern rightly. 
I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me. Entering wealth, enduring wealth and prosperity, my fruit is better than gold, even fine gold. And my yield And my yield is better than choice silver. I walk to the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, endowing with wealth those who love me and filling their treasuries. Okay, a couple of comments and then some discussion. Back to the issue of women. How is, what's the gender of wisdom? She is. I think in ancient literature, wisdom was always considered feminine. Sophia. Right? Sophia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's great. So, again, I think there's some balance here. Granted, we've acknowledged this book was likely early composed for training male leaders, but women have a place here. They're not all adulteresses. And this is true personification, if I understand it. This is not a person who says, I, I, one human being who, it's, to me, it's a collective metaphor. This wisdom that we have gained, it makes some pretty bold statements, doesn't it? I mean, you do, you follow what I tell you, and life will work. If you don't, uh, it won't work. Um, and you notice here, to me, the emphasis is, while wisdom is a challenge, everybody can access it. If, if you look at it, 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 it says that, I think, in, in some place, in, in what Trans read, that, um, that everyone has access to this. And to me, there's grace in that. As I understand Gnosticism, a heresy that grew up in New Testament times, only a select few had this special knowledge. They had climbed the awareness ladder far enough. Being an old country boy of sorts, I like this idea that the ground is level. Everybody can access wisdom. And if you're already a wise person, there's more to learn. If you're foolish, there's, there's hope for you. You can learn. <coughs> Other impressions from this portion of Proverbs 8. Remember, the scholars are saying this This really distills, this is a flyover of what Proverbs is about. You were saying everybody uh, can access wisdom, and you're pulling me back to James again. Uh, James 1 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to, to all men generously and without reproaching, and it will be given to him. So it's accessible Anyone. to everyone. Exactly. Uh, yeah, this is sort of gender messed up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the updated edition. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and I love verse 14. I have good advice. I have insight. I have strength. <laughs> uh, there's strength in that, right? Okay. Um, all right, um, Tim, if you will read verses 19 to 20. You're talking about 22? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. I, I told you I was in a fog. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth when there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, playing before him always, playing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. Okay. 
Okay. What other portions of scripture come to mind when you read this section? Genesis. Genesis 1 and 2 and John 1. In the beginning. Another bold statement. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work. Now, and I want to hear how that impacts you. Let me briefly share how it impacts me. Um, I don't need to tell you that for some time this nation and the world has been in a difficult situation. We happen to be blessed to live in a retirement community that is on Tampa Bay. And as often as I can, uh, I go to the fitness center and then I'm out at the water a little before sunrise. And there were days that that was very healing to me. Uh, as one who, I know this will surprise you, as one who talks a lot, um, one of the proverbs is, that helps me is be still and know. And I engage more and more in what I call listening prayer. I, I don't know, Rob, how long it took you in the past year to discover that God already knew. I, and prayer was often my telling God what I thought God needed to know. And somehow I learned the Lord knows it already. And so as much as I can, I quiet my mind and my spirit and simply and present. And here comes a dolphin having breakfast. Here go birds. The sun begins to come up. Uh, there have been some beautiful pictures I've taken of the kaleidoscope that happens with the cloud. And more, even though I know this, if I do it tomorrow morning, it's a reminder, Bill, you have no control over this at all. This sunrise is grace. This is a message to you that God is still sovereign. And what also comes to me, and I, in my backpacking days, I had this experience with some vistas that um, somehow it's going to be okay. And there's an order and a purpose to creation. The sun will rise and it will set. Um, and I'm probably not doing a very good job of conveying how powerful that is for me. So when I read this, you know, at the very beginning of creation, there was a wisdom woven into creation, an order to all of creation. Enough of my sermon. How does that, in, how does this impact? I, I'm struck. I, I guess I have never really thought about it, but that it uh, portrays wisdom as a creature and creation of God, right. um, like us, uh, like your dolphin, like, right, right. and um, you know, I, I think of it as a characteristic of God, and yet we're all made of God's image. But I just have never thought about wisdom being a creature. It wasn't there from the beginning. Only God was from the beginning, and He created wisdom first. Where it ought to be, I guess. Anyway, the new thought for me. And, and to piggyback on that, it, one of my favorite subjects is however you want to explain predestination. I have the power to make choices, and wisdom to me, the whole purpose in Proverbs is you can make choices. This is written to people who are robots, who have no choice. The Proverbs assumes the capacity to make choices. And that's God designed from the very beginning. Right. Wisdom is only needed by people who can make choices. I'm particularly <laughs> struck by the maternal uh, makeup of, of wisdom in, in a society and a Book that tries so hard to be patriarchal. Um, and I, I, I fight that not only because I have a wife who's a, a minister um, who's very wise and she embodies wisdom for me. But it 
just says to me, we're all equal and we have access to this. Regardless of <laughs> gender, race, age, creed, social status, religion, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Rob? I, I think uh, what you're bringing up for me uh, is the whole question of uh, agency, which I think is just a fundamental uh, coming out of my years in the ministry and uh, growing up in a very Calvinistic Dutch Reformed Church, which emphasized predestination and election. So I'm well aware of that. And uh, coming out of my background in uh, Dutch heritage, the question for me was like, where is human agency? Where is my agency? The question you raise, if, if God in his wisdom knows what's going to happen, uh, then why, why do I need to pray? Why do I need to act? Why do I, is there a place for my agency? And that's been an ongoing thing over decades for me, the whole issue of agency. And if everything is already predetermined, uh, then agency is, is a, a fraud. It doesn't matter. However, uh, when we challenge people to uh, use their abilities, to, whether it's to uh, make a difference in saving the planet, uh, to pray for a, a blessing on the peacemakers in Ukraine, I mean, we're asking them to be agents. Right. to be agents, and God's foreknowledge doesn't rule out their agency. Exactly. And so uh, the, the way I uh, finally came around to that is that uh, I, I believe with uh, the Christian theologians and biblical scholars who say, for God, everything is in the present. Right. There is no future or past. Everything's in the present. Therefore, I can have agency because that's, you know, God may know what's going to happen, but I'm thinking of a human. But from a divine point of view, when everything is present for God, then, yeah, agency does matter. As I say, I think Proverbs presumes that. Yeah. yeah. Now, one other thing about this section, uh, and I don't remember reading this before, toward the end, I was daily his delight, playing before him always, playing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. That's powerful. I am God's delight. Do you think of yourself that way? Yeah, well, not of God's, but I think of me watching my grandchildren. <laughs> and they certainly are our delight. So, you know, in a micro way, with God being the macro. You know, we Calvinists are supposed to believe that if we're having fun, we must be doing something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, this counters that. I love this language. I am God's delight, and therefore I can play before God, play in his inhabited world, and delight in the human race. That's part of God's design, and that's part of what wisdom will lead us to. Now, I respect the boundaries here that we don't get into partisan politics. I don't think it's partisan at all that, in many ways, we are not being served well by our national leadership. That there's, it's so fraught with anger and uh, silo politics, and what if? We had leaders whose desire was the greater good, and I can learn from you, and I think you can learn from me. And how can we make this nation a place of delight for all people? That's part of why I added that into right quote. Whatever you do can be God's work in the world. And the common good. I just love this language. The life and play. All right. Any other thoughts about that? Don't let us miss any of your pearls of wisdom. Now let's go back to the outline 
of the application to our lives today. I wrote the title I chose of this class is Proverbs, Wisdom Literature and Faithful Living. I also resonate with Derek Kidner's uh, title, Godliness in Working Clothes. Again, my upbringing. <laughs> Put your work clothes. My, we built our own house as money was available. And when I come home from school, if dad was there, he'd say, Bill, put your work clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. You know, I did a little of everything. And I appreciate that. And Habitat Pinellas County appreciates it too. Um, yeah. Bill, I have one. Yes, sir. Uh, this came to me in reading this in advance of the class and reading Proverbs. And this is a question for the class. <clears throat> How many of your children or your grandchildren ever mouth a proverb? Is it lost at this generation? I, I, well, my immediate reaction is I don't remember. I'm not aware of my kids or grandchildren doing that. Somebody else. You're suggesting they're not as significant. Well, they're, they're, they're not going to have the benefit of this wisdom if they're not using it. Yeah. I, I would, I think you said to me, I don't know if they mouth it, but they use it. And I heard so. They think it. And I told them to it in their action. <laughs> My daughter, I think, was probably this year. Yeah, yeah. I guess they would. Maybe if they were read it or understood it. I mean, I used it around my children. My parents, my parents used it around me. Do I hear them using it around their children? No, they're pretty young, but I don't know. So I guess one of the failings is I didn't do a good job. <laughs> yeah. But you know, upon further reflection, our oldest grandson is 24, lives in Sarasota, is in a management position in the fitness industry, and it's been interesting listening to him because he's run coming up against it. You know, hires an assistant who just disappears after a week or two and deals with customers. And listening to him, I think there is some wisdom. My goal has been to avoid giving advice, <laughs> tempting though it is, and all about civil reaction. I sat there sometimes and thought, whoa, he's got some wisdom in how he deals with conflict and dealing with the people who are managing him. And, uh, so I think there there is some wisdom there, but I don't hear him quoting. Well, he, he probably learned from you, yeah. you know, just scrolling Well, up. I'd like yeah. to think so. And I remember he, he, he went to another fitness center to apply for a job, and he talks about how the guy there gave him some wisdom about how to deal with the job that he had. Yeah. Just kind of go back and see how you can manage yourself Rob? Yeah. Uh, while Helen, uh, my wife, was in the hospital this past week, I took a copy of the Atlantic magazine, uh, which I really recommend. A lot of good stuff in it. And they had an article I read uh, on how social media has made us dumber, yeah. <laughs> which is really an interesting article. I read that. and. It just got me thinking, you know, and this is the Atlantic Magazine. They usually have real classy stuff in there. And the, the author's thesis was the, the more that you get sucked in to the world of social media, uh, you become stupider. <laughs> you, you, you lose contact with uh, the cultural wisdom around you. You don't know what, the pro what proverbs are. and you're less apt to make good decisions on your own. And, uh, you know, in my generation, in the 1950s and 60s, when we went out to play, it was unsupervised. You just went outside, and nobody watched over me. Nobody watched over me. And I'd be out there with my brother and sister for like two or three hours. I was not looking at my phone and but playing a game. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were there were none to get. But the, the thing was, we had to, we would organize games of baseball in our neighborhood. Uh, we'd have to negotiate what team are you on, uh, blah, 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 where's first base, where's second base, who's going to be the umpire. And we were just little kids, six, seven, eight years old, 
And uh, this article really got me thinking what you're saying there. Um, if, you know, if we're just into a world of social media, um, are we becoming dumber? Are we losing uh, some of the content of being able to exist in the world around us with people who may be different than us? Well, in one of my impressions, and I'm not big on social media, it tends to invite you like or dislike, you yeah. agree or disagree, yeah. Yeah. instead of the slowing down, which leads me to another set of proverbs. I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits, eventually Eight Habits, and my favorite, and probably because it's the most difficult for me, seek first to understand, then to be understood. I think what a difference it would make if we would slow down, and, and it's difficult for me. I sat yesterday and listened to a resident assert certain things as factual about a particular political leader, and I just kept my mouth shut. Uh, and it, everything in me wanted to argue with this person and say, that's a lie. But I thought, you know, Maybe the least I can do is listen and acknowledge that, that he believes that. I'm not saying that was the best thing to do, but to me, this, and I think it gets to what you're saying, <coughs> Proverbs, I think, it, are so attractive to me because it invites me to slow down and think, and that's why I'm sitting out here in the morning watching sunrise <coughs> with my mouth shut <laughs> and my mind is quiet as Bill Hall can make it. And just listen, just be present to what I think is a grace-filled experience. So I think um, Proverbs is a pathway to a more excellent way. Thank you. What is social media? What do you consider to be social media? Well, I think of it's Twitter and Facebook and it, it's where you get on there and you interact with people and post opinions and quotes and so forth. They say it's a form of communication, but there's very little communication that happens, as best I can tell, as we're not on social media. But people are telling you what they think, but you, you as you said, like or dislike, but you don't have a dialogue. And one of the things that was quoted here, Israel's teachers were persistently passionate and they argued, badgered, reasoned, illustrated, pleaded, da, da, da. And I think that out of dialogue comes wisdom many times. But what we have in social media, I'm telling you what I think you can like or dislike, but you don't communicate, you don't yeah, dialogue. You don't know me either. Right? And you can write back, like on an email or something, but but uh, it really is, a, it, it, we've lost something in the art of dialogue and communication. I think the Mishnah was was built with people, with the rabbis sitting there arguing about the fact, and that's how they put together their whole commentary right. of uh, Judaism. So we, we've lost that interpersonal communication, and it's all in little short things that you can type on your phone. Yeah. The text message. Right. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. All right, I'm watching the time. I want to do something special in a moment, and I want to make time for it. And so and I are going to worship at 11. So uh, if you've got some wisdom, be sure to share it before we finish. Let me <laughs> begin to conclude with what I printed under conclusion, again from Hubbard. The contents of Proverbs speaks volumes to our modern age, as they have to every generation. Modulating power with wisdom and compassion is the basic message of Proverbs. I like that phrase. Modulating power with wisdom and compassion. Can such a lesson ever be irrelevant, ever obsolete, ever misdirected? Not so long as the sons and daughters of Eve and Adam. You notice it's Eve and Adam. We think Eve is the one who led Adam astray. We are sons of daughters of Eve and Adam. <clears throat> Seek to make sense of human life in a world where folly is in large supply, arrogance knows no shortage, and fickleness is the way of life. Again, I find that sad and confused. Now, 
Um, in a moment, we're going to read uh, two verses of Be Thou My Vision. I, walking over here, I heard it was a closing hymn of the worship service, an obvious voice for Proverbs. One of my spiritual disciplines is to read hymns and to pray them at times. So we're going to do that in a moment. But what I want to do special is next week, Sybil and I will not be here because a friend of mine that I, among others, helped mentor and encourage to become a Presbyterian minister is preaching his retirement sermon, so we're going to be there. It's also going to be Will's last Sunday. No, it's not. No. You're extending beyond that? Yes. Oh, okay. I thought you were moving. Okay, well, I didn't check with you because I knew you would not want me to do what I'm about to do. I'm in charge of this class. I won't take granted. I thought this was might be the last time. Oh, well, well, I'm in. The recording is real good. I have spoken to Will privately a couple of times and sense some discomfort. But I will tell you that there is only one Will Wellman in this world. And he has had a tremendous impact on me as a retired minister. One way to put it is he has raised the bar in terms of Bible study and preparation. Uh, a good professor is one you don't want to disappoint. Right? I don't want to disappoint Will. Um, and I don't mean that in the wrong way. I think that's that's healthy. That someone's academic and human relations skills are such that you respect that person and you want to help support what they do. Um, Sybil and I are in the church for several reasons and drive from South St. Pete for several reasons. One is the preaching and worship, the music. The other is the adult education. This is the most challenging adult Christian education I've ever experienced, even in the churches that I led. And if we did it, I'm not saying we did it wrong. Again, uh, the bar has been raised. And I uh, very much appreciate Will. I will miss him greatly. And um, after we read this prayer, I'm going to offer a special prayer for Will and Taylor as they be Amen. 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 All right. Let's pray together uh, the two verses and then I will lead us further in prayer. Together, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord, part of my own heart, whatever be fall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Amen. Lord, there are many gifts in life. This day we have reflected on a very special, powerful, existential gift of the wisdom that was created before the foundation of the earth. Just as we were chosen, Scripture tells us, in love by you before the foundation of the earth, we thank you for the gift of Will Rome. We thank you for his academic and personal integrity, for his awareness of the environment, of faith, of those in need, particularly the refugees among us. We thank you for all that he has taught us and all that he is and will be for your kingdom. We pray your blessing on him and Taylor as in their marriage, in their lives together, in what we know will be their continuing engagement in life, grounded in faith, and seeking always the greater good. Hellos are pleasant, goodbyes are difficult, but sometimes until we say goodbye, we cannot say hello to what comes yet before us. 
So guide us in our hellos and goodbyes with will. May you bless him and Taylor now and forever. Amen. 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 Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, folks.